everybody! Welcome to day 14 of Vlogmas! God, that was even more painful than I had imagined it in my head. Yeah, that's why I'm wearing a Christmas sweater and gloves indoors, and not because I dyed my hair and my fingernails still look like that of a corpse. I was gonna do some Zoe Sugg inspired makeup, maybe like a little Kate Moss Rimmel 107 perhaps, but um, then I decided not to wear any makeup. So you're really getting authenticity and realness. But today I wanted to talk about the original Team 10, the original Hype House, the Brick Crew. Now, if you were a teenage girl on the internet in the 2010s, I probably don't have to explain who the Brick Crew was, but if you're unfamiliar, let me explain. There's technically more adjacent people I could be including in this video. Tyler Oakley, despite not being British, Dan and Phil. There was one white guy with dreads who I think got in trouble for having too much fun in North Korea. Does anybody else remember that guy? What's he doing now? But no, I'm going to be sticking to what I think is considered the official Brick Crew roster, which is Jim Chapman, Marcus Butler, Alfie Days, Zoe Sugg, Joe Sugg, Louise Pentland, Casper Lee, and Naomi Smart. Yes, these manila envelopes used to be the talk of the town and not a person of color in sight. Y'all thought the Hype House was bad. Back in the day, these YouTubers were all managed by the same YouTube MCM Gleam, which I'm sure had nothing to do with the constant collaborations between the group. There was a time period where maybe every other video that one of these people would upload would have another of the Brick Crew in the thumbnail. But who are these people? And how did they get into my house? First, we have Zoe Sugg. She's the closest, I think you could say, to a leader of the group. She was definitely the most popular, but she's nothing like that guy on the Hype House show who has to beg people to make bang energy sponsorships. Zoe, I would say, is the only one of this group that I think I could confidently say would be pretty much as successful as she is now if she had never met any of the Brick Crew. And maybe I'm biased because I grew up watching her content, but she's just always given me big sister vibe. And even though a lot of the stuff that she made on YouTube are things that a lot of other people have done, she was a trailblazer. No one does it quite like Zoe Sugg. She started out with a blog online back in 2009 where she happened to meet fellow Brick Crew member, Louise Pentland, and started posting somewhat infrequently to YouTube, but then really got into it around 2011. And she would make a wide variety of things from lifestyle content to makeup to fashion. And the crowd went wild. I mean, who among us didn't buy that red lipstick that Zoe used to wear in every video? I mean, Zoe could talk to a brick wall and I know this because I've seen her collabs with Marcus Butler. Penis. Penis. She's also released a wide range of merchandise from best-selling books to bath bombs to reasonably priced advent calendars. According to her Wikipedia page, she was also named 34th sexiest woman in the world in 2015, and I'd say it's an honor just to be nominated. Now, her partner, Alfie, is everyone's favorite Tory, which, if you don't know, I think is British for Republican. I'm honestly not entirely sure what you could describe his content as before he made daily vlogs. I just remember he got in trouble for that one video he made when he was 16 where like his little brain could not comprehend that a 10 year old was pregnant in Spain. Today when I was in college, one of my friends said that a 10 year old girl in Spain gave birth. So I straight away thought this is a lie. What is he saying? It's ridiculous. But then when I came back home, I checked on the computer and it is true. They let the child do that to herself. There's never really been a thought behind those eyes. But him and Zoe met through YouTube and since this was peak internet shipping culture at the time, the internet begged them to get together. And they tried to fight it, those heteros, bless them, but they, they couldn't deny it. One day, Jim Chapman uploaded a vlog and accidentally revealed that Zalfie was canon. So Zoe had to confirm on a blog post that yes, she was indeed in a relationship with him and the two are still together today. I'm sure a lot of you have seen that they recently had a baby and they seem really happy. Alfie days is eh, but my love for Zalfie will never die. He of course also has released a series of books and merchandise. Famously, he released the Pointless book, which people pointed out was kind of a ripoff of Reckless Journal, and he said, I hear you, I see you, I am releasing two more. The two also have these haunting wax figures. Like, imagine Five Nights at Freddy's, but it's just C-list celebrities from Madame Tussauds. Like, ugh. Next in the group, we have Tanya and Jim. Jim first started uploading in 2009, making men's skincare and fashion content for his primarily tween age girl audience. I don't get it either. But his sisters actually are the creators of Real Techniques and are really famous makeup artists. And so since he was dating Tanya at the time, another licensed makeup artist, they recommended that she start a YouTube channel too. So she initially started doing 
looks inspired by different celebrities or shows. One of the earliest videos you can find on her channel is her showing how to look like Blair from Gossip Girl. And so the two had their separate channels, but of course, since they were a couple, they would have their fair share of couples content as well. And you know it, they all release books. Jim made just, I think, a list of things that he knows. That's my understanding of the book anyways. And then Tanya made a combined like picture book slash memoir. I don't think anyone under the age of like 40 should be writing a memoir unless they're willing to spill all the behind the scenes drama on The Bachelor. That's like the only memoirs of young people I'm interested in. But anyway, she made that. And then interestingly, she made these cookbooks, which were surprisingly very successful. Like I still see people on TikTok making the recipes and supposedly it's really good. And I believe them, but then there's just no way that Tanya wrote it, right? Of all of the girls in the Brick Crew, she was the makeup artist. She never made a makeup book. Why did she make a cookbook? Like, she cooked, sure, as much as anyone does. You typically need to do that to survive, but I just... I was always so confused by her love of, of cooking all of a sudden. She also released one of the first YouTuber makeup lines called Tanya Burr Cosmetics. Yeah, it's giving Claire's. I never purchased it myself, but audience seemed to enjoy it enough. But this was also back in the day when the naked palette was God's greatest gift to her. The two also adopted Martha, a very cute sausage dog. What's Martha up to? Don't ask that. Joe Sugg. I think Joe like invented the goofy YouTube thumbnail. I mean, look at this guy. Like institutionalize him, what a nut. He started doing challenge videos, mostly with the Brick Crew. And of the group, he's surprisingly one of the most successful creators today. He actually became like a legit voice actor in a bunch of cartoons. And he was even stunt casted in Waitress for a couple of weeks in the West End. He's no Cameron Dallas in Mean Girls, but I mean, who can be? I find the whole thing so frustrating. Sounds frustrating. So I'm swearing off He also, wrote some graphic novels, and by wrote them, I mean, I'm pretty sure it's written by someone else and drawn by someone else, but he made me send them like a, a notes app thing of an idea he had, so. Then there's Casper Lee. Casper Lee started off his channel by pranking his mom and telling him that he got a girl pregnant, and he ended his YouTube channel by telling his roommate that he got his girlfriend pregnant. We love to see growth. He also went through a period where he would interview mainstream celebrities like Ed Sheeran, Kevin Hart, Chris Pratt, Everyone's favorite. He also wrote a book and interestingly, his ghostwriter was his own mother. I would rather die than have my mom expose me on amazon.com. He seems to have taken a break from YouTube for a while, so he's now a property investor. He owns a company that's making apartment complexes in South Africa, and he runs a YouTube management company with Joseph. Louise. Louise is my favorite of the group obviously. I don't think that she's actually much older than anyone else in the group, but one, she had childhood trauma, so you know she's the funny one. And two, when she started her channel, she had just had her first daughter, and so I think by nature she just kind of had to grow up faster than the rest of them. Like I mentioned before, she also started on a blog and met Zoe through that, and the two were chummies. She would do beauty, lifestyle, mixed in with a bit of mommy vlogging, and would frequently collab with Zoe Sug, especially. Did anyone else get unrealistic expectations for Christmas with their friends when they grew up? How many are there? 36, counted them myself. 36! We'll get into some of the stuff that she's doing more recently, but back in the day, of course, she also released some books. She released a memoir, and my favorite, she released a diary, which I love because you can trauma dump on one page and then have pictures of Louise on the next, like this. I love it. Naomi Smart. The least likely to get vaccinated from the Brick Crew. Naomi was always sort of like a, a wellness slash lifestyle content creator. She's really into fitness and eating plant-based. And she definitely had the least in common with anyone else in the group. So it's, spoiler, not too much of a surprise that we don't see them around each other anymore. She also wrote a plant-based recipe book. And from what I could see, it's like fine. I mean, if you've seen any other wellness YouTuber who thinks that like, the Beyond Burger is poisoning society, like you've probably tasted some of her recipes. But as someone who's also been plant-based for a pretty long time, it's nothing revolutionary to me. And unfortunately for Naomi, she was dating Marcus Butler. Marcus Butler is living proof of white boy mediocrity. I'm sorry, but you can't tell me that this man is famous for anything than being slightly more handsome than like a Gap model. He also released a book and included this picture in the book, which I had to include. The sample on Amazon? just gave like 30 pages, so of course I had to read it. It's a combination of like dating and diet advice. And like granted, he very clearly states that he's not 
a personal trainer or a nutritionist, but he used to be fat and ugly like you. Not pictured. None of the advice he gives is bad. It's like, instead of having cookie, maybe eat lettuce. And I don't know, it's kind of like he just didn't realize that his entire audience was just a bunch of 15 year old girls about to have an undiagnosed eating disorder. Like, yeah, we know how many calories are in a Coke. We downloaded my fitness pal years ago. Get on it, Marcus Butler. He also used to make music. Doing all these hoes in my thrift shop clothes whilst taking photos. Everyday bro who. But this group was a force to be reckoned with. The boys famously made a YouTube boy band to hop off the fame of 1D at the time, and it got views upon views. They also loved a good challenge, but you know, sadly, they never did a J-Station style 3 a.m. challenge. Can you imagine them summoning Chummy at 3 a.m.? Group was also constantly together and all daily vlogging, so you could get like the same day of content from eight different perspectives. It was never ending content. So if they're so great, why don't we hear about them anymore? Did they film a dead body in an unalive forest? Worse. The beginning of the end was the announcement of Hello World. Now, at the time, Hello World was considered the fire festival of YouTube conventions, but this was before TanaCon just baked young children on the streets of Los Angeles, so the bar has gotten significantly lower since then. But parents were promised for their 200 pounds that they would get carnival rides, access to YouTubers, that they wouldn't be waiting in long lines, and that their children, most of all, would be happy. Hello world! What is Hello World? So, Hello World is going to be epic. Nothing like this has ever been done before, as far as we're aware. At Hello World, there are kind of two parts. There's a daytime experience and a nighttime show. For the daytime experience, picture this. You've got a big street, like an indoor street, but it's kind of outdoory vibes. So you've got an indoor street called Main Street. Along Main Street, you may bump into a YouTuber or two. There's also things happening. You've got carnival rides, music, and there's all sorts of cool stuff. There's also classes so if you want to do say a class of becoming a youtuber and learn how to do things maybe you'll bump into me there maybe we'll do like a class together maybe we'll film something together who knows now notably the group had decided not to go to summer in the city which was the more affordable and already established youtube convention in the area so like tanacon they decided to sort of do their own thing but rumor has it that all of the brick crew had shares in this hello world convention and that's why they were pushing it so much to their impressionable audience and not disclosing their relationship with the company. But it looked like it was going to be great. I mean, the vamps were going to perform one song. Unfortunately, it got horrendous reviews from parents. Even my sweet, sweet Louise came out after parents had been standing in line for hours and said, I just bought a new home, so thanks for paying for it. And like, I know what you were going for, bestie, but uh... It was not the vibe. And famously, Zoella had been promoting the convention, but did not appear on the main stage for any events. And when people were confused about this, she tweeted that she had never actually confirmed that she would be making appearances, just that she would be at the meet and greets. And of course, Zoe being one of the biggest content creators there, people were reasonably pretty upset about this. Hello World was also the last time that we would see Zoe and Louise together in person. Hello World by Chummy, unfortunately. This wasn't the only reason that 2017 was a rough year for the crew. All of the groups started to drift apart by this time in 2017, but Zoe and Louise especially went from appearing in every other video of each other's to barely even referencing each other. They've since appeared in live streams together in the pandemic, and they'll mention each other now and again, but the two have clearly drifted apart. And Louise has since pretty much confirmed that at one point they did have a falling out and drifted apart, but that there's no bad blood between them and that they still keep in touch. Louise ended up going through a divorce in 2016. She had another kid. She rebranded herself for targeting towards a more grown-up audience. And then Zoe moved to a mansion much further away and was dealing with her own share of controversies. So I feel like it was confusing for, you know, the high school and college viewers who are watching her. But as an adult, I can just say adult friendships are hard and give them a break. But this was not the only way that there were cracks appearing in the group. The most charismatic couple on the internet, Naomi and Marcus, also called it quits in 2015. So by 2017, like a good half of the group felt pretty awkward around each other and collabs were becoming less frequent. I mentioned before that Zoe was the most popular and unfortunately Zoe also had the most controversies after this peak. First, her book. In 2014, Zoe published Girl Online, which quickly became a number one bestseller and actually broke records for the most sales in the first week from a debut author. Zoe had been mentioning in blogs before that she was really excited about it. She would often do those like time lapses of her typing on her laptop and come to find out that the book was ghostwritten by another person. Penguin Publishing did admit that there was an editorial team 
and Zoe did confirm that she had help, but did claim that she was still involved in the process. To what degree, I guess we'll never really know. But fans were understandably upset because they thought that they were supporting Zoe's work, and for all they know, they had just purchased something with Zoe's name on it and no actual attachment to her. And because people were upset about the book, people also started digging for tweets, and of course they found some pretty distasteful ones. Zoe did manage to recover at least a little bit. She went on to write two more books and claimed to have more involvement in the other ones. They didn't sell as much and they got like mixed reviews from newspapers, but you know, they're not exactly the target demographic of these books, so who's to say? The next controversy, probably her biggest of all, was the advent calendar of 2017. For the low, low price of 50 pounds, you could get an advent calendar from Zoella herself. And even though Zoella had a pretty established line at this time of different beauty, bath, and makeup products, uh, the advent calendar was stuffed with Things like glitter, stickers, single cookie cutters, and just like a couple other things the crew had picked up from an AliExpress dropshipping. People actually did the math online and found that you could actually get all of these items individually at the dollar stores, and of course they bought these things wholesale. So the advent calendar was horrifically overpriced, and also the content of it was stuff that no one would ever want. And you know, we have the benefit of hindsight now in 2022, and I personally wish that Zoe had just gone the full Chanel route and made it $500 and just said, you know what, yeah, I would do it again. But no, instead she made a very sincere and quick response. And by that I mean she shoved a non-apology at the end of a 20 minute Vlogmas video. I will defend Zoe in the sense that um, this was before YouTubers, I think, were trained on how to give apologies, and I think her management just really hung her out to dry with this situation because she just said that she had worked on the product's design for over a year, which bestie, maybe you need a couple more if that's the case. And then two, that she did not set the prices supposedly when she was done coming up with the design and claimed that Boots was the one who had priced the item at 50 pounds. I don't know whether or not that's true, but regardless, she's the face of the brand and she clearly should have been more cautious about things that were being sold to her very young audience. And Boots did eventually cut the price in half and Zoe quietly discontinued the brand in 2019. And between the years of like 2017 to 2020, I feel like Zoe and a lot of this group really struggled with their content. What used to feel sort of natural and everyday felt like it was forced and it was really strange to see someone who lived in a million dollar mansion doing their primer calls again and again and again as if that was a place that they were regularly shopping at and even though she tried to keep her energy the same it was clear that she was reaching a sort of exhaustion with the internet. In 2019 she was actually one of the most unsubscribed to channels and her main Zoella channel has hasn't been active in years at this point. She has gotten back into vlogging but Really up until her pregnancy, it was a, a rough time for Zoe content. Another non-controversy that I'll include, but I don't think anyone on the internet actually cared about, was the Zoella blog was still up and running, but she had sourced it out to like her Zoella team because now Zoella is like a brand and she just goes by Zoe Sug. The Zoella blog had made a post about adult toys that you could use and some random British school came out and said that they would no longer be promoting Zoe's content because they were very disappointed in her brand for associating with adult toys. And Zoe very calmly and rightfully said that the demographic of her blog is entirely adults. She at this point was nearing 30 and the school quite truly had no business trying to police what Zoe could or couldn't post on her blog. But yeah, rough times like I said. And it wasn't going much better for Alfie. He too got really stuck into the daily vlogging. And as we know, daily vlogging really took a downturn in 2016, 2017. He was really struggling to come up with content. He had a podcast for a while. He would do random challenges. He went through like a ghost hunting phase. And then he tried to do the one pound challenge. I'm gonna try something out that I've never even thought about. The total bill for my food and drink is gonna be under one pound. I don't know if this is going to be possible. Some ice cold water. Oh, I can't even use our ice because I pe We don't use ice like- oh. Oh my gosh. I realize I can't even use that. I'm going to have to use this tap water instead. Today's going to be far more interesting than what I thought. And just looking at the one pound challenge, I have a lot of questions as to what he thought was going to happen. Because I hear that, 
I just think, okay, like I'm gonna eat what's already in my pantry, right? But no, he ended up in sticking to the rules of the challenge he set for himself. Zoe has a Waitrose like card for both of us that we use. Complaining about it the whole time. Thank you. There's your pound. There's my pound pocket money. There's my pound dinner money. It's super annoying because I have a card for snog that gives me unlimited free snogs for a year. And I can't use it because I feel like that's cheating. And buying like hundreds of dollars in expensive toys for himself. But no food, no drink. So don't worry, I haven't spent anything, anything out of the one pound budget. Bought myself a t-shirt, got a game for me and Zoe and our family and friends to play. I bought a couple of earrings for this here, a beard comb. Understandably, the internet got pretty mad at him. And his apology, arguably, was, was more scandalous than the original video. That I'm not a Tory. This, this even sounds like stupid for me saying this coming out of my own mouth, but the amount of tweets yesterday from people calling me a Tory, I feel like I just need to say in this video right now that is for sure not the case. I could be mad at Alfie for this. And like clearly it was cringy and in poor taste, tone deaf, but like this wasn't malicious. To have malice, there needs to be thought. And I, get, I say again, there is not a thought behind those eyes. Alfie just was not thinking, and you cannot blame him for what he's not capable of, okay? Alfie and Zoe also had a controversy when Zoe joked about how her favorite game is to scream at out her window for help to pretend that Alfie is abusing her? I don't, I don't know what the joke was, but the two quickly took down this vlog and issued apologies. Again, just weird, out of touch thing to say. I know that like these controversies do seem kind of like a low bar when we compare it to the actual crimes that happen on the internet these days, but it's important to note that all of these people really branded themselves, one, on their relatability, and two, on their squeaky clean image, so I think these hits to their authenticity hit them much more than they would like another content creator. The Tanya and Jim divorce. Tanya and Jim broke up after nearly 12 years together and five years of marriage. Interestingly, Jim went on to marry Sarah, a model he found on Rhea, very shortly after he announced the divorce, and it was often speculated that he had cheated on Tanya with Sarah, and that's why he was able to move on so quickly. It has since come out that that was probably not the case. So Sarah and Jim recently had a baby, and she was receiving some nasty comments from people, presumably Tanya's sock accounts, because really, I don't know who would, would say this, but she ended up saying that actually Jim and Tanya had gotten divorced because of infidelity on Tanya's part and not Jim. According to Jim, Sarah just happened to be the first person he found on Rhea when he decided to date after being divorced. And there's actually a podcast where Jim talks about it. Looking at it in hindsight, because this was before his wife posted the thing about Tanya possibly cheating, it genuinely looks like he's fighting to say that Tanya cheated on him. I would say Tanya's never said anything. Um, yeah. She's never come out and called me a cheater. Um, she hasn't done the opposite. Um, like I have, if I'm being totally frank about it, like, you know, I've sort of said there was nothing. <laughs> You've addressed it. I've addressed it. I'm trying, I'm trying to, I moved on first. Sure. As far as the world is concerned. You know what I mean? Like, it's really hard to say this without sort of making uh, accusations or whatever. But as far as the world knows, I moved on first. It's not necessarily, I should stop there, but it's it's tricky to be accused of something when they've only got limited information to to use, right? And the first time I saw this, it was like in a TikTok edit with the euphoria music that goes like <laughs> with like the the messages from Sarah's Instagram story across it, and it struck struck something in me. I don't know. And Tanya gets a lot of flack for changing. She dyed her hair blonde lost a lot of weight. And you know, if Adele and Rebel Wilson are proof of anything, it's that women can change their bodies in any way without the world's permission. So people were really weird about that. And she stopped doing YouTube, got really into acting, and you know, she's not a great actress. There are worse things to be than being a bad actress. She actually works with the UN um, to help support like Syrian refugees. And she seems actually pretty committed to it. Like she went to Syrian camps and spoke to people who were seeking asylum in the UK. And she now has a new brand called Authored, a new makeup brand, which she said was inspired by Glossier. And I was like, okay, when I hear that, that just means very expensive Vaseline for white people. But it's actually like a really inclusive and seemingly like well-intentioned brand. And if you look at the Instagram, 
It has a lot of different stories from people she met through her UN experience, the tinted moisturizer she released. It has 12 shades, but it's 12 shades actually like across a color spectrum. It's not just like nine shades of beige and then black and it's like inclusive. Like I feel like a lot of the hate Tanya gets is honestly a little unfair because up until a month ago, we didn't know that she cheated and she had been getting flack way before that. And even if she did, I don't know Tanya and Jim. And Jim clearly is very happy in his new relationship. So I don't think he's losing sleep over it either. What does bother me is Martha. Martha was supposed to be shared between the two after their divorce. And has since become quite a bit of controversy because she has not publicly appeared on either of their social media in years. And supposedly, Tanya had to block the words Martha sausage and dog on her Instagram because people would not stop asking about it and so now people have resorted to commenting where's the hound on her Instagram but uh, yeah besties uh, Martha definitely got rehomed or swallowed whole I don't know it's not looking great for Martha rest in peace Marcus Casperly and Alfie really seem to struggle with the change in the YouTube platform as they started getting less and less views and even though they would consistently try and rebrand themselves they would instantly give up when they realized it wasn't making them money and move on to the next thing and the whole thing just came across like they were upset that they were no longer making a million dollars off a marshmallow challenge and calling it a day. They were especially upset about the existence of commentary channels, specifically people like iNabber and I'm Alex. Alfie Days actually invited iNabber and I'm Alex onto his podcast to have an open conversation about commentary channels. I really try to like do my due diligence for this YouTube show, but I cannot get through that interview because I'm Alex and I Nabber are clearly so nervous and so uncomfortable that they're they can't make any solid points and Alfie is like coming in hot and it is just like too much cringe. I refuse. I don't get paid for this. I will not watch it, okay? Marcus Butler is really into NFTs right now, so it's probably for the best that he's off YouTube. And so like I said, this group of people naturally drifted apart and a lot of them really struggled with losing their relatability and notably they're not the only content creators to change or struggle with change. I think Emma Chamberlain used to really struggle with the like we want the old Emma and when people would give her flack for like being able to afford a Gucci belt now when she used to make fun of people who wore Gucci belts like but I would say now like she's back to making content and I don't think anybody complains about that. They just wish that she would upload more. Because at the end of the day, whether she's rich or poor, she's still like an interesting person worth watching. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to make it seem like just because you become rich means that you can no longer be an interesting content creator. There are countless YouTubers who are infinitely more successful now than when they started out and they still maintain a loyal audience. Like, do we think that PewDiePie is still living the same way he <laughs> lived when he started his channel? Like, no. But they all really struggled to adapt with the times and honestly came off as pretty entitled when they started to see the lack of results that they were seeing before. And this is also why I would say that Louise and Joe are two of the more successful people post this sort of breakup because they weren't afraid to like go and do their own thing and rebrand. Louise doesn't get the same amount of views that she used to get when, you know, back in the day, but she still has a very solid core audience who love her. And she's come out with a podcast. She's released multiple different books since then. Like she's doing the dang thing. And she clearly is much happier now than she was when she was just trying to keep appealing to this like 13 to 18 year old demographic who she didn't relate to at all. And Joe Sugg made cartoon videos after the Brit crew, so that's like less of a good example. But you know what I mean? Like he was flexible and willing to change up his content, whereas everybody else felt very much stagnant and stuck in what they were doing. But I am happy to say that I feel like Zoe and Alfie are kind of going through a revival right now ever since they announced their pregnancy. Like I was really excited for them and I haven't been watching their content in a really long time. And so Zoe's been back to uploading, talking about her trimester and stuff, which I don't watch because like family vlogs kind of Blech. But you know, it does seem like they're happy making the content that they make and they're not uploading just because they feel like they have to and they're enjoying sharing their life, you know? And ultimately, all of these content creators could have turned out way worse. They could have pulled a Tabuscus on us and let's just be grateful that that didn't happen. I don't think it's realistic to expect to run a YouTube monopoly, an empire for a decade and not expect to be different at the end of it. All of these content creators have changed. Some of them aren't on the platform anymore. Some of them maybe just aren't as relatable to the audience as they once were. Regardless, I think this group of people really set the blueprint for what 
uh, YouTube collaborations could be because who knows if we would have gotten Team 10 and the Hype House without them. I'm kidding. Jake Paul definitely would have exploited people for money um, the second he got the chance. But you know, they definitely changed some things. Anyways, I hope you all liked this little trip down memory lane to talk about the YouTubers who raised me. And let me know if there's any other content creators of the past that I should do a deep dive in. But otherwise, feel free to like, comment, subscribe. Um, and I'll see y'all later. Bye.